It was the best 10 minutes of my life. I'm Mel's, and this is Strangeful Things. Unsolved, unresolved, and super complicated. Strangeful things. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Strangeful Things. I'm Mel's and I'm here with Shuey and Acadia. How y'all doing? Hey, hey I'm doing great. Just uh, got rid of my last kid at college today, so she's oh, gone. So empty got nester. The house to myself, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. just me and uh, and my wife. So pretty sad. Man, I've got several. I've got several years before I'm an empty nester, but I dream about it daily. <laughs> <laughs> Our nest started empty and just we just rolled with it. You'll probably do a lot of a Why lot of around. around. Yeah, exactly. You're probably doing a lot of puzzles, Chewy. <laughs> I heard that's how thing go. That's how things go. You get puzzles, and you know, just to, when you start doing things to quote pass the time, that's when you know things are really going great. Oh no! I love <laughs> a good thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, though. Oh, that's a lie. Yeah, that's never gonna happen. No, oh, I don't okay. have nearly the attention span for something like that. Oh man. So only thing I that couldn't do a thousand-piece puzzle if they were numbered. <laughs> <laughs> so true. I mean, it I'm takes like, you, yeah, like over a year to do it, I'm sure. But uh, it's worth it in the end. <laughs> oh, that would be a fucked up puzzle to make, though. Like, have all the pieces be numbered, but not in a row. <laughs> yeah, so they'd, they'd all be... <laughs> like, it just goes 1, 709, 350. <laughs> yeah, that would be terrible. <laughs> or one where you have to do math. Or like, okay, to know the next puzzle piece, you've got to yeah. divide. Oh. <laughs> it's a Fibonacci sequence. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> well, I got my hair cut today. That's my, no that's my way. big... Yep, and and I'm going to give a shout out to friend of the show, Melissa, who not only gives awesome haircuts, she is now um, a super good embalmer of dead bodies. She's getting good at oh. embalming. Oh, nice. She used, to just, she used to just do their makeup and hair, but now she's she was explaining to me how you got to like cut their neck open and shove the thing into their mm. arteries and cut another vein out and goosh out all their blood and then squeeze their arms and stuff and... So is this asking. how you knew that? How you know that she's gotten really good at it? Well, because that was kind of weird. That, like, how do you know that she's really good? Because at she it? said she said that they're starting to let her do them on her own. Oh, impressive! Yeah, she's not like apprentice in bombing, so she's a badass, and she gives good haircuts because people don't run from me anymore. Oh well, thank you, Melissa. We all That's appreciate right. it. But I just, I just want to. Have we had a large enough sample size to verify? Of people that that's running correct? from me? Yes. Of not running from you. I try to hang around people that can't run. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way to do it. Yeah. So I, I may be messing up the experiment a little bit by hanging around the infirm. <laughs> but. <laughs> I got to do what I got to do to you keep my you. streak alive. That's right. <laughs> oh. So, Mel, this episode is all you. What made you choose this story? Well, actually, I was browsing through YouTube makeup videos, and I found this young lady that does mysteries and um, kind of sometimes outlines like serial killers. Like She does a lot of true crime stuff, but she'll tell the story while she does like really Bomb ass makeup. And so she did an episode on Emma Philipoff. And I was, for some reason, just really drawn to it. And it sparked my interest. Well, I'm going to jump in and say one other thing because that's really freaky. Because Melissa told me about that mystery makeup lady today. Oh, really? And recommended that I should watch it. She's awesome. Hmm. I love her. I love her. So I guess we have to stop making videos now, but we can't do makeup. Well, I could just do makeup mm. for my eyes through the mask. There you it go. Would just be, 
just put a just put a filter on it like do like yeah. a video through like Snapchat or Instagram or something. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Put Filters some only help. This big baby Acadia. <laughs> talking oh, yeah. to everybody. I love it. <laughs> Female Acadia. <laughs> okay, so on 11-28-2012, Emma Philippoff disappeared from Victoria, B.C. She was last seen around the Empress Hotel between 7 and 8 p.m. Honestly... This is going to sound stupid and like a big fat lie, but I have been to Victoria and I have insider info. As a matter of fact, I actually stayed at the Empress Hotel. Yeah, but that's that's a fancy hotel. So why did they let you in of all people? Because it was back when I had a job and mattered as a human being. But so... You can't get there, like, at least from the U.S. I don't know how it is from Canada, but the airport is super, super tiny. So you had to fly to Seattle in a regular plane and then take one of those "Eh, eh, 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 eh," planes, like, where they have to go, oh, sorry, we got to circle for a while because the wind is blowing in the wrong direction. Like, they, where they go, okay, well, I need you to sit on the other side because Big Larry's on this side. Like, all that, like... Everything to make you as nervous as possible. Oh, and, no. But it's, I mean, it's amazingly beautiful, but it's so cut off from everything else. Like yeah. it's really, really cut off. And it was, it was a really neat experience. And that's where I found out about all dressed chips, which are the greatest chips in the world. And I ate poutine for the first time. Oh, poutine is yummy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, poutine is good. So... I just found out about that recently. So that's uh, that's my 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 little back of the envelope. Pretty town, very nice, good food. Everybody was very pleasant, and uh, that is Victoria, British Columbia. Not sure what to do touristy wise because I was working, but they did yeah. have a miniature museum, which was like a bunch of dollhouse stuff when everything was <gasps> teeny tiny. That's Ooh. a little creepy shit. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, Beetlejuice or uh, something like yes. that. Yeah. Yes. The uh, Well, that actually sounds pretty cool, that place. It really, really was. Well, now that we are done with the local flavor, I'm going to start over. And I should point out that this case is newer than we usually do, but I feel like this is something that should have attention put on it because it's unresolved. Mm. And unresolved Definitely. is creepy to me. And so that's why I wanted to bring this to light. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So on 11-28-2012, Emma Philippoff disappeared from Victoria, B.C. She was last seen around the Empress Hotel between 7 and 8 p.m. She was seen talking to the police at this time. Her Mazda MPV was located in the Chateau Victoria parking lot with nearly all her possessions still there. Inside was her passport, a library card, digital camera, some clothes, a pillow, ornaments, her laptop, and a few library books. She was basically homeless and stayed at a local shelter, so her car was believed to be used for storage. She asked the Chateau Victoria staff that morning if she could leave her vehicle around 7 a.m. She was only 26 years old. Hmm. Yeah, that was the part, yeah, that really got to me. She was said to be in a distressed and vulnerable emotional state at the time of her disappearance. Emma had always wanted to live out West and made the move to Victoria in the second half of 2011. She was 25 at that time, had no job or home lined up. Her plan was to figure things out once she arrived. She told a friend that she had a feeling something big and amazing was going to happen in Victoria. So upon arrival, she lived with a childhood friend and their partner for a few months. Then she moved to another unit in the same building. Um, She then eventually got some jobs. She was a barista at a cafe, then a seasonal position at a restaurant named Redfish Bluefish. Hey, Katie, did you uh, eat there when you went? No. Well, I looked it up to see if I did, and I didn't, but I did see it while I was there because it was on the water. It's like a taco stand, and the only place I'll eat fish tacos is San Diego. (laughs) Well, (laughs) so far, this has made you seem super fancy and snobby, Acadia. (laughs) Yeah, I know, right? Like, you've changed, man. Like, you used to be really down to earth and humble. Used to be? I'm a goddamn popper. As a matter of fact. 
<laughs> in fact, go ahead and visit Patreon. Doc. Is that the best way to define a person? Well, you know what? It's it's accurate. Go ahead and visit patreon.com slash strangeful if you want to support the show, since I am poor. Classy. I am down to earth, <laughs> which is the same as classy. What can I say? I have had brief flashes of fanciness, but mostly I'm not fancy at all. And I seem to have sunk back down to my actual regular level of fanciness. Oh, my God. Which is zero. <laughs> devoid of fancy that's right <laughs> well i'm just going to use that as a segue back into the story because it's as good a chance as i'm going to have <laughs> after about three months in victoria emma became more transient in her lifestyle so she moved in with another friend for a while lived at hotel 760 where she also cleaned rooms lived on a few boats, then took to sleeping in the woods and in trees. She lived in the attic of the Sandy Merriman Women's Shelter from February to November of 2012, on and off, usually about a month at a time. So basically, she went out there with no plan, and when three months or so, she was sleeping in trees. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing that gets me, like the sleeping in trees. Yes. Like, oh, she's sleeping in the woods. All right, I get it. She's sleeping in the woods. She has no money. She can't afford to stay anywhere. But yeah. actually in trees, like, that's well, pretty impressive. I mean, if you had, thing. if you just slept in the woods and you had sandwiches in your pockets, the bears would get you. Oh, so you've got, to, right. go, you've got to go up high. Those bears are always stealing my picnic baskets. That's right. Hey, boo boo. If, if, hey, bears, boo-boo. if, if bears could climb trees, there wouldn't be humans, probably. <laughs> what? They would have gotten us all. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Because everyone thinks they're cute, especially the I baby ones. Bears. But the mom is always around somewhere getting ready to bite your head off. Uh, like that know- guy in that documentary. Oh, remember that fucking guy, the the bear guy from that documentary? Yeah, the guy killed by like, him. Yeah, oh, I'm friends with all the bears. Oh my Ooh. head! Oh, <laughs> <God>. <laughs> that's old crazy old Joe <laughs> over there. He's looking a little honorary today. What the? Listen, I have to go on an aside right now because all right. everyone knows I'm an animal lover. If you don't know, now you know. I will cry at the animal commercials, whatever. So the other day, actually, I think it was just yesterday, I got this pop-up on a news, like one of the news apps that I have downloaded to my phone. And it said that this bear sniffed a lady's hair at a park in Mexico, and they castrated the fucking bear. Well, that doesn't seem fair. That's what I was saying. But that's not a punishment and crime being even thing there. No. If the bear had raped the woman, then yes. But I'm just saying, right. like, people are so fucking just god awful. But anyway, yeah, well. I, just speaking of the poor bears, I have to just say, I'm thinking of you, little bear. Well, he wasn't, he wasn't a little bear. He was an adult bear, but still. Yeah, but they, why are they attributing, like, human quality? Oh, he smelled perfume. That means he's horny. Like, it's not like the bears, if they were presented with two people and one of them was in a bikini, they'd be like, oh, I want the one with the bikini. They're not <laughs> well, like, <laughs> You know, and I was thinking to myself, of all the things that bear could have, like, snatched that lady's head straight off her body. I mean... It seemed like it was a docile bear. I don't know. Yeah. Whatever. But uh, I, that's got nothing to do with our story. <laughs> no, so, no, no, it doesn't. Although we have not ruled a bear out as a suspect. <laughs> no, right. That's true. That is true. Okay. Well, while she was in Victoria, Emma would send her family and friends emails. Now, these emails would sometimes be poetic and upbeat, but they usually remained cryptic in nature. So she would occasionally call on holidays. You know, no big deal. No one Mm -hmm. knew she didn't have a permanent residence. She was hiding a lot of things. Um, She enjoyed things like meditating, reading, and spending time with other homeless people around the area, street performers, and local artists. Friends described her as free-spirited, creative, giving, private, 
independent, trusting, flighty, and brave, which seems like a lot of adjectives for one person Mm -hmm. that goes in the broad spectrum of things you can be like seems to me like you would be either quiet and reserved and a little free spirited, or you would be, you know, free spirited, creative, brave. Yeah. I don't know. I'm super giving. Oh, well, thank you so much for this. Oh, can I come over and, and (laughs) like repay you with the dinner or something? No, fuck you. I'm also private. (laughs) Exactly. Right. And and I'm flighty. Oh, um, thank you for this, but I gotta go. You know, I don't know. Um, Smoke pellet. (laughs) Smoke bomb. She's disappeared. All right. Anyway, you can cut that part out because that was a bit of a spoiler. (laughs) (laughs) Um, She did enjoy taking care of people and pets. She was considered a skilled chef, which really blew me away because I, she didn't have a lot of jobs that I could find. So that part was weird to me. Um, she was a great photographer and she was an artist. Um, she kept many journals and a blog. So she was pretty, again, wide open, I guess, but not wide open at the same time. She had one relationship supposedly during her time in Victoria. The relationship was said to have ended positively with no hard feelings. Um, again, she was a pretty private person, so she didn't really talk about the relationship. Um, Emma wanted to live a pure lifestyle, so she quit drinking, smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, and consuming sugar. She was a vegan. Mm. She began eating less and less and became alarmingly thin. She mainly only consumed water, and that's it. One friend sometimes described her as monk-like. This began the paranoia, so a big change in Emma's personality started happening when she started not eating as much and only drinking water. She became withdrawn, fearful, and started distancing herself from others. So she bought the MPV whenever she bought it in hopes of traveling. So this must have been before, obviously, she became withdrawn and fearful. Um, instead, she used it for storage and had been inquiring about a cheap mechanic shortly before she disappeared. Around this time, she seemed to be preparing for some kind of move, so possibly due to the changing weather conditions in the area. Um, some said she didn't like the winter months and she wanted to travel to Costa Rica, San Juan, Japan, Mexico, and California, just to name a few places. All right. what What's an MPV and how can you drive one to Japan? <laughs> well, an MPV is a multi-purpose vehicle, so it's a uh, it's a minivan. <laughs> but I guess they wanted to make it seem like cooler, so they didn't say minivan. I don't know that MPV sounds great, but <laughs> but it is not multi-purpose enough to get all the way to Japan. So that must have been like a little side trip. I got MPV in college. <laughs> No, you did not. You disgusting, <laughs> disgusting person. Ugh. Not because of the MPV. And he was my roommate. But because you made the joke. MPV is oh. not the. It's I, HPV. I know it's what HPV. it is, and I was trying to be. I was trying to be politically correct there. By the not the M call. is for mammal. Gosh. <laughs> mammal virus. <laughs> You are so ridiculous. All right. All right. Focus. Now, Emma wrote in her journals that she had potentially been suffering from mental illness from the age of 11. And due to her secretive nature, she was able to hide this from family and friends for years, which is (sighs) breaks my heart for her. Um, Mm -hmm. One friend made the observation that Emma could have been obsessive compulsive because she would arrange patterns using things like feathers, shells, rocks, and food. Oftentimes, she asked others to participate in these rituals with her. One friend called her dad, James, and let him in on their worry when she was found in some kind of euphoric state during the night. So she was basically standing outside and staring at the sky. Emma was super pissed to learn that James had been contacted and declined his offer to fly her home. So this, this was in 
Victoria, where she was starting to just kind of stand in one place and staring off into the abyss, I guess. Great. Yeah. She insisted she would be fine on her own. Her parents were divorced, and her father failed to inform Emma's mother, Shelly, about the incident. Shelly has stated that she would have flown out immediately had she been made aware of what was going on. That's pretty fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess, like, if she had been hiding the mental illness, then even if someone contacted her father and was like, hey, kind of saw Emma doing something weird, and he reached out to her, and she was like, whatever, you know, brushed it off. If she had Mm -hmm. done a really good job of hiding that all of those years, then, you know, you might just be like, man, she's doing something weird. I don't know. Right, right, right. Yeah. And and, and it's not unusual to hide it either, you know. Right. Well, it also could be, I mean, the, the, the possibility also exists that she didn't know you know what well, I mean? Right. Like if she you're undiagnosed, you can just think everything is fine, and you know mm-hmm. I'm going to hide in the this fucking tree. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah. For them, it should be seeing somebody. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Because at that age, do you really know that? Something's off. You, I don't think you do. Right at no, the age I of eleven. It's, I think it's people observing you. That you, right. it's really the change that people observe. You know what I mean? So I mm-hmm. guess if you're depressed from the beginning, you're just kind of boned because then people will be just like, oh, they've always been like that. Yeah. But there's so much, there's so much that has to happen, excuse me, for you to be treated properly. Like, right. It, it can't be the year you have like some asshole teacher who doesn't give a shit. Like, it's got to be like, you got to have the right teacher or the, or the right you know, somebody that's in the school that you deal with. And- right. According to friends, Emma had been stressed because she was feeling like she was being harassed by someone she had an unpleasant experience with years prior. So she didn't provide many details or reveal who the person was to her friends or in her journals. That's where that private, private uh, nature comes in, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One roommate said that Emma avoided men in social situations where men would be involved and did not stay in co-ed shelters. She started to seem frightened to go anywhere besides the shelter or the pier. Approximately two weeks before she disappeared, a friend said Emma was outside the shelter, cold and wet, standing still, staring at a group of crows, which is called a murder. Mm -hmm. During this this time, staff at the shelter also noticed Emma's behavior and related it to depression and paranoia. She kept curtains drawn at all times and moved furniture out of the shelter to the curb, claiming the furniture had been talking to her. Well, that's a fucking deal breaker right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not just, hey, you down a little bit? Yeah. 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 Well, Emma had also begun selling, donating, and throwing away personal belongings. The shelter staff thought she might be suicidal, but due to privacy laws, they couldn't contact her parents. They called police. uh, (laughs) Privacy laws. Um, They called police instead to request a mental health check, but the police told them to call back if the behavior persisted. They never contacted the police again. Yeah, and a friend tried to be encouraging to Emma and got her to get out of the shelter by taking her to a YMCA for a membership and to a library. Well, the fucking cops, like, what were they so fucking busy doing that they couldn't go check? Well, they were Canadian cops, so I assume they would be at Tim Horton's. (laughs) What's what's Tim Horton's? I don't know. Tim Horton's is their Dunkin' Donuts. Oh, it's their Dunkin' Donuts. Okay, now that's funny. (laughs) (laughs) No, it makes sense. I was like, who's Tim Horton and what what is the relevance here? (laughs) Well, back to on a serious note. Emma made a series of frantic phone calls to her mother starting on the night of November 23rd. Shelly assured her each time they spoke that she would make arrangements for her to come home. 
Emma called back the next day, insisting that she would stay in Victoria to work things out on her own. The cycle of changing her mind occurred four times over the next four days. During one of these phone calls, Emma told Shelley she did not know how she could face her. Emma's final call to her mother was made on the morning of November 28th. She said, don't come, Mom, not today. Shelly said there was a noticeable change in Emma's voice, which concerned her. Shelly put everything on hold and took a flight out later that afternoon. With a history of mental illness in the family, her mother was very worried and felt Emma needed her. According to witnesses, Emma returned to the shelter at around 6 p.m. that evening and was informed by staff at the shelter that her mother was on the way. She became visibly upset and anxious and quickly stormed out of the shelter. Shelly arrived at the shelter around 11 p.m. and learned that Emma did not claim her bed that night. Shortly after midnight, shelter staff called police to report Emma as a missing person. So what do you think so far? Oh, this is just, this is just heartbreaking. Yeah, it is. Oh, my God. I mean... I wonder why she was so freaked out about the mother coming. Right. But something had to be happening. Well, I was wondering if it was a manic episode or something where it's like, okay, now not that that wouldn't be rooted in something going on, right? Like right, right, right. someone oh, following yeah, her yeah. or something happening to her. But also it just feels like it's a bit manic. For her to be calling and then come out here and calling, no, don't calling to come. It just, you know, it and it's hard. It's so heartbreaking to me. Like I can't imagine as a parent. Oh, this is totally heartbreaking. Oh my god. Well, the thing that sticks out to me is when the time she said she didn't know how she could face her. Like yeah. she, like she thought she had done something wrong. Right. I didn't quite under. I mean, it never really got into detail about what that even meant. No, but I mean, you would, uh, anything we do would be extrapolation, but if she like had hidden, you know, whatever condition she had for that long, and then all of a sudden she didn't want to admit to her mother that she actually had the condition. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Which would make sense if it had been formally diagnosed, but since she was still kind of winging it, it's, it's kind of hard to believe that that would be, you know, the way it went down. Right. I guess it's possible. though. Yeah. So now we're going to go through a timeline of events to see if there is anything that sticks out to either of you. And Acadia, I know you found something when you were looking into the case. Yeah. It's just adding on to something in the timeline though. And Shuey has something for the end. Yeah, 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 I do. Well, thanks for research shaming me, ass yeah. lights. <laughs> <laughs> You you interested us. It's not our fault. Okay. Yeah. I like that better. I, I got yes. I sparked your interest there. Okay. That's right. <laughs> anyway, here's a timeline that I did not recreate from scratch, so don't come at me. And remember, <laughs> this is all from 2012. So on 11-20, she got the membership to the YMCA. When she went there, she was observed leaving and returning four times within a 14-minute period. She appeared anxious and kept peering out the window. Objection. Overruled. You aren't the judge of it. Okay, well, what, what is it? We just started, for Christ's sake. <laughs> I, just, I just think this 14-minute thing is very suspicious because the only way that you should be in and out that much is if you're carrying shit into the house from your car or you smoke a little at a time and are trying to hide it from your family. Okay. Like, there's no reason to go in and out that much. Right. Okay. Well, I will accept your objection, even though you are actually agreeing. But whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> so, on 1121, Emma arranges for a tow truck to take her car to Burdett Avenue. Um, the driver observes her as upbeat and wanting to get back to her family, in her words. So, when she was talking to him, that that's kind of the story that she was putting out, right? Right. right. On 1123, she calls her mom for the first time. On 1124, she calls her mom to come out, then calls back to change the plans. 
1125, she calls her mom to not come out, and the van is towed to Chateau Victoria. Is there any significance that we know of surrounding the van getting towed all over the place? Well, not that I found. I assumed it was broken down and was getting Mm. fixed and apparently didn't get fixed. Like, I think she may have eventually wanted to get it repaired. Okay. So on 11-27, mom calls the shelter and is shocked to find out that Emma has been living there. She gets the number from the caller ID, okay, because Emma had never obviously told them that she was living in a shelter, so she didn't give her the number that she was calling from. Um, Chateau Victoria asks for the van to be towed, and then Emma makes another call to her mom asking her to come out. How often do you call your mom? I ask because I didn't call mine nearly as much as I probably should have. I talk to my mom every single day, but I could have an unhealthy attachment. (laughs) So you might not want to use mine as an example. (laughs) No, Joe was the same way with her mom, I think. Maybe it's a girl and a mom thing. Yeah, mothers and daughters. Yeah. Yeah. Because I would have to say my relationship with my mother is a bit less congenial. (laughs) Um... You think last week she had, she had posted something on on Facebook and my my twenty three year old daughter um, saw it and was like oh you know that's really not true she should be looking she should look at this and she responded and said you know grandma please check your sources before you post stuff like this it's dangerous to post things that are incorrect or whatever oh boy. Um, she said it, she said it much nicer. My mother just blocked her. <laughs> <gasps> oh my. Like shut her down. <laughs> oh my goodness. So my mother and I I'm laughing cuz I know Shuey's mother in that. <laughs> Oh my very, word. Very unsurprising. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. If I want to tell you it's a Martian plot, I'm going to goddamn tell you it's That's a Martian right. plot. And I'm going to throw in that I tried to be the best mom I could. Oh, God. That's, That's all I ever did. It was the best for you. Oh, but no. you ungrateful sons of bitches. Not the mom. Yeah. <laughs> my- you ungrateful. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> All right. Let's get back on track. This is a serious story. Yes, yeah, that's a separate <laughs> tragedy for another story. For another day. That's yeah. a side yes. story for you, yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's a chill time. That's part of my three-time <laughs> singles. That's a special. <laughs> I'm a season four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the soundtrack to season four. So be ready for Shuey Time singles. I love it. I love it. All right. <laughs> So on 1128, this is the last day, okay? We've got a lot of times here to go through, so just hunker down and bear with me because they're all important to the story. So at 4.30 a.m., Emma calls Shelly and changes her mind one last time. Don't come, Mom, not today. Shelly tells Emma that she won't fly out to Victoria, but against the advice of the family, she takes the first flight out that afternoon. 7 a.m., Emma goes to the Chateau Victoria. She's very upset about the notice on her vehicle and asks staff for another day to move the van, which they grant to her. At 8.23 a.m., Emma is captured on video surveillance at the 7-Eleven store at the corner of Douglas and Humboldt Streets, where she uses her debit card to purchase a $200 prepaid credit card. She is wearing a beige winter jacket, camouflage pants, and her hair is tied up in a bun. She's carrying several bags over her shoulder, including her orange purse. She lingers by the store or she lingers in the store by the door, nervously peering out the window. At 10 a.m. while riding the bus, Julian Huard sees Emma on Pandora Street across from Alex Goulden Hall. Now this is my info. Okay, go for it. So, Huard, according to Emma's father, would not leave her alone from all the way back when they lived in Perth, Ontario, where the Philippoffs were from. 
So remember earlier when she said she thought she was being harassed by someone that she had known before? Right. Yeah. I think this is the guy. Yeah. Since, since, since Emma didn't have a Facebook, Julian would send Facebook Messenger messages to the father to give to Emma, which is pretty ballsy and, and fucking weird and gross. And weird as shit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. really is. Um, <laughs> just send to the dad, you up? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, according to an interview he gave to a podcast this year, 2020, he met Emma at a music festival in 2011. They went canoeing and then took walks and shit in the neighborhood. Not walks and shit in the neighborhood. They they took walks and shit in the neighborhood, I should clarify. (laughs) They were friends, but of course, Julian wanted more than that because men are gross and he visited her at her mom's house. And that was the one time that they kissed. But the next day, Emma said she didn't want things to go any further. Things had gone too far, and she didn't want to be attached to anyone since she was leaving for Victoria, and she said for him to leave her alone. But, of course, he didn't leave her alone, and he kept calling the house, and they saw each other a couple more times, but I'm sure it was just him begging and her trying to be nice. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but eventually it seems like she told him to stop calling her mom's house because she he left some simpy note for her at her friend's work. Mm. Oh, God. Mm. And from mm. there, we have some suspicious coincidences where he just happens to bump into her. Mm. First, strangely, he finds her when she's going for a walk and insists on <sighs> going with her, even though she didn't want him to. And mm. remember, this is shit that he's admitting. Mm-mm. Like, so who so knows what saying? he didn't admit? Yeah. yeah. So he's saying, yeah, she didn't want me to. Yeah, she, but I, 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 I convinced her. Baby. Yeah, I went with you. It's a free, I can walk wherever I want. Right. Oh. Then he just so happens to decide to move the 2,600 miles west to the exact same city she moves to. Isn't that weird? Oh. And then a month later, he happens to run into her on the street. No, he did not. That's, oh my God, this is, give me the chill bumps. What a fucking dink. <laughs> I'm thinking that I'm going to channel a little like old school Jen Martinelli and say men fucking suck. <laughs> they suck. They should die in a fire. Um, die in a fire. We, do, we do indeed. But Emma was nice to him and said that his weird note made her uncomfortable. The one he left with the friend at work. Yeah. Um, but she was happy to see him. He tried to make plans with her for later, but she was having none of it. And no lie, Julian described this awkward ass meeting as quote the best ten minutes of his life, Ugh. and that's where the quote wow. from the beginning set comes from. So, him asking her out and her going no was the but best them talking minutes. was the best ten minutes of his life. Wow! Loser. I mean, I know he's a fucking simp, but how low was his bar? Yeah, like, that's really low, right? Oh I mean, gosh. I'm sure that Mills, you had guys doing that for you all the time back yeah. in the day. <laughs> I I don't know any man that would say meeting me was the best ten minutes of their life at all. So <laughs> also, I don't picture you as going on a lot of walks. <laughs> Hell no! <laughs> and, and hardly ever shitting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I might shit on a walk, but I don't know if I'm almost like go on a walk willy nilly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're separate things. <laughs> like, they should be. Yes. No, but I could see. I could see those. Like, because apparently the way they the way they described it, those uh, those times that they like he kept trying to convince her that they should go out and whatever like that. Like, I can see. Hmm. where he was like pleading his case and whatever you know what i mean it's just yeah. shit that it, like you try everything and then you go all right well i'm gonna try one more thing but you don't then move to the other side of the fucking continent no like that's not that's not that's, that's not, not an not accident romantic. that's not like um no Playing that you've lost that love and feeling would be romantic, but oh, not man. any of the things that he did. No, nothing it's just he did. Creepy and gross. Yeah, yeah. It is pretty creepy and gross. Well, then he said he saw her again at the beginning of November, but she was sad and confused and didn't recognize him. And the last time he sees her is the story Mel's is gonna tell, but there's one more fishy thing. In December of twenty twelve, he bumps into Emma's mom at the library 
and, quote, learns of the disappearance and gets involved in the search. Mm. But remember the Facebook messenger shit he sent the father? Yeah. Well, the father looked them back up, and at one point, Julian described himself as her stalker. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, he might have played it off like he was a kid, but now people, like, were suspecting the shit out of him. Oh, hell yeah. But the yeah. cops gave him a polygraph test, and he passed. And he maintains <laughs> that he doesn't know what happened to him. Yeah, okay. Well, we all know about polygraph tests. I mean, mm-hmm. whatever. So, yeah, on the last day, he disembarks the bus. He was on a few stops early to talk to Emma, who is standing on the edge of the sidewalk, one step away from the road. She's wearing a puffy, light-colored coat, her hoodie pulled up over her head, and her hair flowing out in disarray. I know that feeling all too well. (laughs) She is carrying plastic bags in each hand with more bags over her shoulder and across her chest. He observes her from the back. Ugh. And pfft, I'm sorry. This, is, this guy's a fucking creeper. Um, he observes her from the back in profile but cannot see her face, so he decides to go register for his health card as planned and returns to find Emma still there, standing motionless on the corner. So what's he registering his insurance? Yeah, well, it's because National Health Service, so he was just saying, this is where I live now, I guess. Oh, okay, okay. Hmm, right. He steps onto the street in front of her and peers into the hoodie to ask if she needs help, and Emma slowly shakes her head as if to say no. He observes her for a short while until he decides then and there he is done with Emma. Oh, my God. She won't accept help when offered. And, Acadia, you told me this time he said he would regret for the rest of his life because he thinks that she committed suicide, right? Yep, that's what he says he thinks. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm sure that's what he thinks. I don't like this. I don't like it one bit. All nope. right. Back to the timeline. Noon. Some people think Emma visited the library around this time. Early afternoon, a friend colleague sees Emma sometime in the early afternoon near Our Place Soup Kitchen on Pandora Street. Her hair is tucked into her jacket. She says she isn't feeling well at all and can't talk. He asks if she needs a hug, but she retreats with an uncharacteristic, horrified look on her face. Wasn't Jeez. that uncharacteristic? Not if you're not. It would be if you weren't hard. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. 1 p.m., a witness sees Emma looking vacant-eyed, slowly shuffling along Pandora Street. She isn't wearing a hat, and her hair looks as though it has been freshly washed. What? She is carrying several white plastic bags, an orange satchel, and is wearing camouflage pants and a white fleece jacket. The witness later reports the sighting to police and eventually hears back from the Victoria Police Department, who take the full report. Afternoon. Two people report seeing Emma on Douglas Street sometime in the afternoon. They were so concerned by Emma's strange behavior of walking back and forth in the street, looking confused and lost. They immediately called police who took the report. However, it is unclear if they followed up. This was the first 911 call made that day. The witnesses recall her wearing shoes, though they later heard from others who saw Emma that day wandering barefoot in the street. I mean, like, That's weak. how many people have to see this poor girl? Which I guess maybe they didn't interact with each other, so they didn't know. But still, that's just so, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. It really is. Yeah. Another witness reports seeing Emma walking downtown that afternoon with an older man. No description of the man was provided. Um, A man who visited the Rock Bay Shelter claims he saw Emma there at some point with that afternoon. No details are provided. And this is a shelter Emma refused to stay in as it was co-ed. So I have to take that one with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. There's some knock knock them dead police work. Yeah, I know. 4 to 6 p.m. 
Emma is sighted by the same person at two different locations. She first crosses their path as they exit the main Douglas Street doors of the Bay Center. She is shuffling, moving slowly northward on the west side of Douglas Street, her long mane of hair flowing out the side of her hood. These people are fascinated with her hair. Yeah, right. About 45 minutes later, they are in a car stopped at the corner of Douglas and Finlayson streets when, to their surprise, they see Emma crossing the street in front of them. She glances their way and gives a sad smile. No. They really want to help, but fear she might question their intentions. They go to the Victoria Police Department headquarters to report the sightings on November 30th. So this was after she disappeared. Yeah. Uh, police take their contact information, but never call back to get the full report. Of course. Jesus Christ. Yeah. 5.54 p.m. Emma uses her debit card to purchase the prepaid cell phone at the same 7-Eleven where she purchased the prepaid credit card. So video surveillance shows her paying for the phone. Then she lingers in the store by the doors, peering outside as if she is afraid to leave or is avoiding someone. That cell phone was never activated. Six o'clock p.m., Emma goes to the Sandy Merriman shelter. Witnesses at the shelter report Emma becoming very anxious and and upset when told by a staff member that her mother is on the way. She storms out the front door. One resident tries to run after her but quickly loses sight. She reports Emma having mixed feelings of relief and fear about her mother's arrival. Though Shelly spoke with staff on the phone the day before, she did not tell them she was headed to Victoria. (laughs) This is such a timeline, man. 6.10 p.m., a driver with ABC Taxi picks Emma up near the shelter. She asks him to take her to the airport, but suddenly changes her mind. Even though she had $2,000 to $3,000 in her account, she tells him that she can't afford the $60 fare and asks to be dropped off exactly where she was at. That's really smart, actually. Why? Because if you get dropped off at the same place you got picked up from, then you can say you didn't get brought anywhere and the ride is free. That's little known taxi law. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh. But what, what exactly did that accomplish <clears throat> other than driving around? I don't know, but it's a fuck long way to the airport, so 60 bucks makes sense. Hmm. Mm. When they arrive, okay, let me start that over. Hold on one second. <clears throat> I should have bought some water up here with all this, all these speaking parts. <clears throat> all right. When they arrive, she asks if she can sit in his cab for a while. The driver observes her behaving strangely. She becomes anxious and paranoid when she hears the dispatch radio. She stares at it and asks, why is there noise coming out of that? She pays the fare with her debit card and quickly exits the cab. So she says she couldn't afford it, but then she paid for it with her debit card, mm-hmm. not the prepaid one, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Oh. 6.15 p.m., Dennis Quay, an acquaintance of Emma, sees her standing barefoot on a corner looking disoriented, paranoid, and seemingly unable to cross the street. He asks if she is looking for someone or if someone is following her. She doesn't say much and keeps looking all around her. She asks him to walk with her for a bit, but becomes increasingly uncomfortable with his questions and concerns. So she decides to walk on her own. At approximately 7 p.m., he enters a nearby restaurant to call police and waits until they arrive. He observes them talking with Emma for a while, then leaves, assuming she is safely in their care. Hmm. What? I mean, how many times were the police called this day for her? About this one girl, like, wh- why aren't they all looking for her? And <laughs> how fucked up had she, must she have been acting for, like, everyone she meets? To call the police. To go, well, yeah, the first thing I should do is call the cops. Yeah. Oh, just. This is so, this is, like, heartbreaking about how somebody that obviously had issues And all these people try to reach out to help, and the help never gets to her. Mm -mm. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. All right. We're nearing the end of the timeline here, people. 
7.17 p.m., police locate Emma barefoot and clutching her shoes by the Empress Hotel on Government Street, and two offers, officers assess her for 45 minutes. Okay, I do have a question. There was, like... They didn't communicate over the radio. Like, people didn't... I just... It's hard for me to believe that police didn't start being like, oh, my God, it's this Emma girl again. Right. I don't know. It's... This is the part that blows my mind. I mean, there's several parts that blow my mind, but this... The whole police thing really, like... It's... I can't figure it out in my mind, no matter what I do. Well, I I, I think part of it becomes, you know, that's one of the things that, that... they talk about with saying, oh, well, you should send social workers in some instances instead of police. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because the police are just like, well, are you robbing a bank? Nope. All right. Go about your day. Right. You know, they're not right. fucking psychiatrists or whatever, yeah. you know? Like, look, you got like a, a domestic dispute thing going is the best thing in a charged atmosphere like that for a cop to run in with a gun. Like, yeah. it would be like yeah. some shrink being like, all right. Exactly. Well, according to police notes, at no time did Emma engage in a dialogue, but rather answered with one word or nodded her head. It was almost 30 minutes before she even spoke and then only gave her name at their insistence. She refused to put her shoes back on and said she was just taking a walk and planned to meet with a friend. By 8 p.m., police decide she is not a threat to herself or anyone else and watch her walk away. This is the last confirmed sighting of Emma. The identities of the two officers are protected by privacy laws and details of the conversation have not been released. Shelley sent in a freedom of information request on May 19th of 2015, which was denied by the Victoria Police Department without reason. Yeah, the reason is they don't want to fucking get caught. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. They know they fucked up. Fuckers. So like, me- even her oh, refusing to put her shoes on was mean she was a danger to herself because she could have stepped on a bottle cap. Yeah, exactly. And what, what was the date on this? On the request? No, when, yeah, no, when this was happening. 2012. No, the, it, was, it was November, though, right? Yeah, it was November. So it was November in British Columbia. Oh, that's true, too. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. All right. 11 p.m., Shelly arrives at the shelter and learns Emma did not claim her bed that night. The shelter calls police immediately to report Emma missing. 12 a.m., police arrive at the shelter shortly after midnight to take the report. Emma is declared a missing person. Okay, so on December 2nd, a witness came forward and said he saw her and she was acting weird and to remember the name Emma Philippoff. And then repeating her own name three times like she was Beetlejuice or Candyman or something. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> three days after that, on December 5th, someone used her credit card to buy a pack of smokes. The guy who did said that he found it on the ground, and I'm pretty sure $200 would just about cover a pack of smokes in Canada. <laughs> uh, so he found it you know, to not be too suspicious. But then he went and acted suspicious by calling Shelly's mother three times and telling her not to believe where the cop said he found the credit card. He well, how said did he know he her found- phone number? Yeah. They she said- might have had reward. They did. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. So they said he found it on the side of the road, but he told Shelly that he was a drunk and didn't remember where he found it. But they gave him a lie detector test too, and he passed it. So I guess the questions they ask on a Canadian lie detector are like, uh, are you a creep and or weirdo? Okay. <laughs> uh, so everyone passes. Yes. Cause they all answer. Yes. <laughs> well, <you're- laughs> yes. The answer is yes. Well, that's not even the creepy one. No, the creepy one is in 2014. A business owner sees a guy crumpling up a reward poster of Emma that had been in the window. He said, 
it's a missing person poster, but she's not missing. She's my girlfriend and she ran away because she hates her parents. They called the cops and had video footage of him, but he was never found. Okay, so yeah, that is creepy. And yeah. what do y'all think happened? I kind of think that she killed herself. Do you? I, I can't believe I go along with Huard, but I think she was acting so erratically that she had some kind of break. Mm. She either either she killed herself off in the woods where she slept, which you would assume that they would have found her, or she just fucking bolted and took off somewhere and didn't want to be found. Well, yeah. And since she was so off the grid for the most part anyway, it wouldn't be too hard for her to do. You know what I think? What? I think that she went off and because she didn't, she only drank water, basically. I think that she just dwindled away and like passed on somewhere and was never found. Right, right, right. You know, kind of like into the wild. <laughs> so she's like a Jane Doe s- uh, right. somewhere else. Yeah, like. Interesting. You know, that's just, that was where my thought went to. Because if she, she's spacey, she's acting erratic, you know, she's staring off into space. You know, she's doing all these odd things. And then she disappears into the night and we know that she's paranoid. She doesn't eat really. You know, I don't know. It just seems like it was a recipe for disaster on that front, meaning that she just slowly, I don't know. I hate to say that. Like, I don't even like to say it because it's unresolved. Like, I don't even want to put that out in the universe. And that's what happened to her. Right, right, right. You know, you guys are probably right. But... I I don't know. There's just something about Huard. Yeah, that's true. Like, yeah. Like, you don't move hundreds of miles to the same city of, as thousands. Thousands. Thousands, right, thousands of miles to some random girl. You And, and it, the way he, um, he said how, like, their relationship kind of, like, ended, how he said, you know, that was the end of it for me with her. You know, she didn't want my help or whatever. Like, it just, it, I can't imagine that there is a point like that for somebody who would do what he did, like, to be near her. Like, is yeah. there a point of her? Because right. the most magical moment of his life was the, the first time she told her that she couldn't really be with him. So, you know, so yeah, what that's true. possibly do. Yeah, what His could she possibly low. do <laughs> to make him say that's enough? I didn't want anything to do with her after that. Yeah, right. That's the only right, thing. Right, right, right. You know, I no matter what it is, this is just a tragedy. This, this girl just sh- shouldn't be dead. And mm-hmm. um, but but that's kind of where my head's going. Yeah. Oh, just a tragic story. But they're still looking for her. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not the cops, because they were never they looking, were never for, looking her, but for her, but fucking dinks. Yeah. Well, I suppose, I mean, the mother is still out there looking. Yeah. And this other guy is doing podcasts, the Huard guy. But I'd still put 10 bucks on him. Even if I was betting on something else, I'd still put ten bucks on the side on him, just because I think it's probably, you know, there's a chance. Yeah, that's why I said uh, you guys are probably right. Like it probably was something. I I, I hate to agree with, with with Mel's saddest ending. The saddest <laughs> timeline. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, but you know, I you're probably right. But yeah, there's just something there that. That just doesn't feel right with him. Yeah. Well, I guess you can tell people how to find us. Oh, I will. Which kind of sounds shitty. I will. Do it. I'm going to. 
I'm going to do it right now. Good. All right. Well, if you want to get in touch with me, you can, I can be reached uh, with Twitter and uh, Instagram at Shoey Time, S H O O E Y Time. And if you want to get Acadia, he is at Acadia on Twitter. If you want to get in touch with Mel's, and everybody does, this is a very cool <laughs> story. Um, we have uh, uh, Twitter is Mel's Bells 84, and on Insta, she is Superficial Mel's. And if you want to just keep in touch with the show on Twitter, we are at Strangeful Pod. Yes, and if you have a moment, please take a minute and rate and review us. Um, we'll take as many stars as you want to give out, but we'll also take good old-fashioned word of mouth as well. Yep, tell a friend. Oh, you can also hear uh, Mel's uh, It's Every Week, right, on Damn Fine TV? Oh, yes. We're on a little staycation right now. But yes, every week on Damn Fine TV. And we basically just talk about the latest TV shows that are out. Are you going to do uh, Lovecraft Country? I don't know yet. Well, you better hurry up and decide because it's not Sunday. I know. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, it's supposed to be good. I mean, we're going to watch it anyway, whether you cover it. Exactly. Yeah, I'm watching it regardless. Yeah. And if you follow them, they do all sorts of fun little things with like games and and oh. they just did a poll. They just did like polls that. and stuff. So thank you. Yeah. Chewie's in charge of our Instagram, Definitely. so we don't have anything like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I I post angry leftist propaganda at this point. <laughs> <laughs> that. Yeah, but that's only on your account. You don't post on our well, account at it all. It depends on which one is signed in when I do it on the phone because it just goes to whichever one I'm on. Well, that's just great. Well, I end up liking it with the other guy, so it kind of gets there. Oh, so, well, so it's, but, okay, so it's not strictly leftist propaganda. I also post a lot of cute animal pictures. Yes. That's 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 very on brand for a show other than the one that we actually do. <laughs> anyway, um if you want to if if you want to support us so that we can get somebody to be in charge of the fucking Instagram, you can go to patreon.com/strangeful and uh you can get the free premium content um that comes with being a patron. You can get chill time which is so chill. Oh, uh, you can't listen to it while you're driving because you might get so chill you'll fall asleep and die. Uh, but uh, Unfortunately yeah. for Shuey, he missed the last um, chill time. I know. Or he missed an episode, so they did a chill time. And yeah. uh, they were nice enough to um, say mean things about why he wasn't there. <laughs> well, that's what that's- happens. It's like passing out at the party early, okay? <laughs> that's right. I, I we had to mark college you up. I got written on when I felt when That's I right. passed out. So I guess this is the <laughs> this is a, the virtual the, the virtual <laughs> equivalent of that. And uh, you can also go to our Discord, which I don't know where there's a link to it, but ask me on Twitter and I'll link you to it because in the there's there's patron only parts of the the Discord, but there's also just the regular strangeful Discord that you can go hang around in. And talk to other people and talk about and Acadia, messed up shit. Acadia is in there all the time talking mm-hmm. to y'all. Yeah, because I care about our customers. <laughs> I care about Not like you two. I post stuff and people ignore it. Nobody ever responds to anything I say, so I don't bother. They're there for you. They mm-hmm. love Acadia. That's... No, it's not true. <laughs> See, because what happens Acadia. is Acadia. What happens cats, is cats in Acadia. I respond to them. <laughs> That's why if you just come in there and drop some kind of bomb and I then leave. Hey, how's, like, okay. how's everybody doing? Nobody nobody cares about my leftist propaganda. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I never talk about that stuff in relation to this place. So um great story, Mel's. Really and um, really shoot me the link to that that um, that gal's YouTube so that I can link it in oh, the yeah, of course. in the in the notes of the post that you're going to write. <laughs> um, 
and uh, we'll get this up and then uh, go see her because apparently she's got a lot of groovy stories too. Yeah. And uh, we're going to have a special surprise coming up in the not too distant future. We are going to have a guest. <gasps> so it's not going to be just three of us. It's going to be four of us. Dun, dun, dun. Is it Chris Hemsworth? Mm-hmm. <gasps> if no. only. Uh, no. But it is someone from Australia. <gasps> so that's kind of a weird guess that you made. Nice. Very interesting. No, no Hemsworth. <laughs> Charlize Theron? Well, no. I'll, I was going to no. say, on that note, leaving it on the Hemsworth note, count your blessings, everybody, because there's three of them out there that we can, <laughs> we can count yes. right now. They are blessed. <laughs> And thinking about the Hemsworth, keep on flat. (laughs) 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 Silly. Bye. It's so stupid. (laughs) Bye bye.